what I want to talk about is like clearly that gave you like no way to actually start working on this stuff um, which is the point like again like I want you to be able to talk a little bit about machine learning with other people but like your job is not to say like oh yeah I'm using a fully convoluted knit layer here here and here just not how we need to work on this stuff um, I want to talk a little bit about like some of the work that I see in visual art with machine learning and like how I would categorize it I think that might be more helpful for you guys to think about like how would I categorize the type of work I want to be working in and do I see examples that I think are really cool and I want to recreate or like play with something similar <clears throat> Um, so, I mean, the first thing is, like, there's a certain poetry to this type of stuff. Um, I'm sure you saw something that made you interested in this class, um, but I'm going to just show you a couple pieces that I think are just really beautiful um, and also, like, sort of poetic in their own way. Um, I do have sound for some of these, although the sound is not great. Uh, so this is Mario Klingemann. Um, he's probably one of the more famous machine learning artists for visuals. Uh, so one of the things I think is really interesting about machine learning as it is today um, is that this isn't good, this isn't good, right? Like, if you were to train a model and say, like, hey, make me some faces, like, you wouldn't look at this and be like, great, you made some human faces. You'd be like, great, you made some really fucked up, creepy looking faces. <laughs> but there's, like, this really beautiful, like, it's still beautiful in, like, a dark and semi-creepy kind of way, right? Like, when the eyes split off and you have two new faces, like, there's something really poetic there that, like, sure, we as, like, individual artists could generate, but, like, it says something about machines and how they see things. Um, I think that's, like, a lot of the work is, like, it explores both how to make beautiful artwork, but also, like, what is a machine seeing when they're making this thing, right? Um, so this is some of my work. Uh, this is... Uh, that's similar to that um, horses the zebras model. So this uses cyclegan, and this converts birds to flowers, um, and flowers to birds. Uh, and you'll learn a little bit more about what exactly that means uh, next week. Um, but essentially, I fed it a bunch of old vintage illustrations of birds and old vintage illustrations of flowers, and it's the fact this thing that tries to convert them to each other. Um, and it creates this like beautiful like in this top row it creates like this beautiful like camouflaged bird scenes like now that all the birds are green like the florals have like sort of enveloped them and then down here you just get like these absolutely like ridiculous sort of looking things where like the flowers are now growing feathers and like birds are starting to like come out of these plants um so again it's like very creepy but like you can kind of understand when we go through this, like, what it's seeing, right? Like, it's saying a leaf kind of looks like a feather. So, like, let me make a feather, or let me make a leaf look like a feather. And in this case, like, well, I know that, like, flowers, or, like, the foliage has a bunch of green, so let me just have that green envelop them, and then, like, I know it's going to need to be a flower, so I'm going to, like, cover it in, like, this floral-looking stuff. Um, so, again, it's, like, once you understand how it works, the magic disappears a little bit, but you also, like, can kind of see how the machine is looking at things. Um, these are style transfers. Um, you're probably familiar with style transfers as like that app that converts everyone to a Van Gogh picture or like a Kandinsky or whatever. Um, 
and those are like the novelty versions of machine learning um, and like it's certainly a version of machine learning but like it makes things feel kind of cheap and like not as art artsy right like so I think style transfer is actually like a really interesting medium to explore that most people don't because it's been ruined by like really shitty novelty apps um, so this is on my work again um, what we're doing is again we're taking a floral image we're feeding in different textures into the system and it's spitting out like these more like sort of like fluid looking things and within this uh, model um, you can do different stuff like you can play with like hey take the colors from the textured image or take the colors from the um, image that I fed you, the original image. So there's so many opportunities for different parameters within this um, that I think this is like a really interesting place to play in that most people just don't because they don't know it's available to them. Um, they also, most of the time it's like with those dumb apps, there's no parameters, it's just like, here's a selfie, convert it to a Van Gogh. Um, whereas within a model like this, you can say, I want different textures, I want multiple textures, um, so you can start to almost create like collage images. Um, you can create different scales, um, so it reads different layers of texture, those sort of things. There's so much to explore within just this model alone that I would I would I could probably teach like a three week class just in style transfer, um, and people would create very different images than like the shitty stuff people have seen before. What was your previous example? Was uh, this was Cycle Game. This is Cycle Game. Cycle Game. Cycle. C Y C L E. And, I'll, and you'll learn why it's called cycle again later. Um, but that's, yeah, that's it. And this is called style transfer. Um, this piece, which is Mario's piece, uh, we won't be able to do in this class, but the way he builds this is, uh, have you ever seen um, uh, face trackers? So basically if you like have a video camera and you have your face, uh, it can track your eyes, it can track your mouth movement. Um, so what I think he does is he trains on a thing called Pix to Pix, P-I-X to P-I-X. Um, he will take a bunch of face tracking shapes, so just like your, the outline of your mouth, your eyes, he will pair that with a image of one of these old style like women. Um, so basically they're matched up perfectly, right? So here's a picture of a woman, here's a picture of the face tracking shape. Do that for a thousand images. And then what he's doing is he's seeding in an image and saying, track the, fa track the facial features of this, convert the next image. Then he might move the face a little bit, take the produce the next image out of that. Um, so it's like kind of a custom network where he's got like two different neural networks or like machine learning models running off each other. But it creates this thing of like, that's where like, where the eye is. It doesn't know if it's like one eye or two eyes, so it splits. Um, so it's really, really interesting work. Probably a little bit more advanced in this class, but like really worth like thinking about more. A little bit, yeah. So deepfake works with the same idea, where it tracks your face, um, and then it can map a new face onto those facial features. It's definitely the same idea, yeah. Um, so this is also my work. This is probably the stuff that you might have seen. This is what Bralio put in the uh, poster for the class. So this is StyleGAN. Um, and StyleGAN is different from Style Transfer. Super confusing. Um, but this has been trained on 1,500 floral images that I like. Sort of found vintage images I cropped into them, though. Um, and then StyleGAN has a way where it builds. We'll talk about more about StyleGAN next week. But StyleGAN creates a space of images, and then you can animate in that space and you get different images back. That might not make any sense right now, but that's basically what that's basically what's happening. So it's not even interpolating. It's actually saying that each one of these points is a new image, but because those, those points are so close to each other, you get a different image. So basically, think about, so think about that graph that we drew last time, or that graph we had before, which is like this. So if I said this was black, uh, this is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, RGB, this might be 1, 1, 1, 1. But now imagine those are pictures. So it's not interpolating. It's actually not saying, like, hey, take this image and convert it to this image. It's actually just saying, like, if I draw a path through here, I will get a gradient, right? But each one of these points is a, is a different color. 
So there's no math going on like to interpolate. It's just saying like this is a different picture. Yeah. Yeah, and so with this thing, you can control the speed that it jumps points. So if you make the speed really quick, it's going to have a ton of different images. If you do it really, really, really slow, like that image will like very slowly change. Um, yeah. Uh, this is my favorite piece. I'm just going to talk, uh, or we're just going to watch it. Well, it's like 15 minutes, but I might just skip through a little bit. I don't know why I thought that was 15 minutes. It's only three. I think it's usually I like do demo that in like a 30 minute lecture. And it's like, oh, this is 10% of my, the, my lecture. Um, so, I mean, just amazing, right? Like that was pretty cool. Um, so those are four or five different trained models, right? Like every time we switched modes or whatever, um, he has a new training set. I thought he was doing this with, uh, with CycleGAN. And we'll talk about like why I, th why I thought it was CycleGAN. He claims it's picks to picks. Um, not a big difference. Uh, just means I actually think picks to picks would be harder to do it. But if that's what he did, it that's what he did in. Um, but again, so he was sort of taking wave images and then showing the machine what the parallel of what that should look like in his little camera with his little like props, what that should look like together. And then eventually the machine just learned, cool, like. I know what a I know that this like bundle of cords should convert to a rock. I know that this yellow part should be waves, the white part should be sky. Um, and then he's able to once it's all trained, then he can take the video and like so basically you can record that video and then you can split up into every individual frame, feed those frames into the machine learning model. It spits out the images, and then you can put it all back together and make a video. So I doubt this is real time. I'm pretty sure that wasn't real time. I'm pretty sure that's like a 
um, recorded, break up into frames, do the model, uh, run your test, get all the new frames back, convert into video. Um, so it looks really cool like this because it's like, that's cool, like he did it all at once, right? But there's a little bit of magic behind the scenes. Um, I'm sure that he had to do some pre -pro like production to make that all work. Do most models like only work like with single frames in isolation, or are there ones that like? Yeah. So basically, the way a model works is it only looks at image. It only looks at an image. Um, so basically, for a video, you have to break up into frames. Um, what uh, What else were you thinking about there? Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so most of the stuff we're gonna we're gonna be working with is static images. Um, I'll talk, I've got some other stuff here that's called Max Frame Prediction, which takes a video, splits up into frames, tries to guess what the frames are, comes back with another, within more frames that you then turn into a video, right? So like, a lot of this work is like, how do I break a thing down into frames, convert it back to other frames? Like this, this is really all I'm doing is I'm taking one at each one of these points, I'm converting, I'm creating an image, and then all I'm doing is like bringing those back into a video editor and like, creating all those frames and turning them into video. So again, this looks really great because you didn't see the hour it took to produce all those individual frames. You didn't see me do the work to like bring them all together. Like I couldn't run this real time. Um, it'd be, it'd be, there's also, I think this one's 2048 by 2048. So like doing that real time would be impossible. You could maybe do like a 128 by 128 pixel real time, that might work. Um, but it's really hard to do some of this stuff real time because generating a lot of information all at once. You can use the sounds for, I'm guessing anything else besides images, like you don't use sounds or. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, so sound is not a, not a easy thing to do. So it actually turns out. Um, how much time do I have here? I got time. <laughs> um, so it turns out images work really, really well for machine learning because you got pixels. So if you take each one of those pixels, you can learn stuff about the, the individual pixel. You can learn about all the neighboring pixels. Um, so it's basically like way easier to do machine learning on images. If you think about a sound wave, the problem with a sound wave is that you only get that one slice in a second at a time, but you don't get the individual sounds within that slice, right? So it's really hard to actually learn the individual pieces within a single wave file. They're getting better at it, but it's still pretty hard. Um, I did actually see one project where a guy used these models to produce uh, a spectrograph, which is like a way to describe a, a sound. Um, so he created spectrographs with these networks and then fed the spectrograph back into a, to a sound making system, right? So like, you could do that. It sounds totally weird, it does not sound like music, it does not work the way you expect it to. But again, that might be cool for machine learning or whatever you're working on. Um, okay, cool. So. That was all like just like really cool, like beautiful looking stuff. Um, and I don't want to say like that that should be that should be plenty for anyone, I think. Um, but there's some other things that people are thinking about working in. Um, so I assume everyone's familiar with the Uncanny Valley. Cool. Um, so this is I really don't like the sound for this thing. Um, this is the latest uh, version of what's of the StyleGAN model. Um, so these are all fake faces. None of these faces are real. Um, which, in a lot of cases, you can kind of be like, yeah, that, that maybe looks a little fake. Um, in other cases, it looks pretty, pretty damn realistic. Um, I'm going to ask no one works on faces in this class, because I just think it's like a... You're never going to get any better than that, and it's a creepy medium to work in, and it gets into like all sorts of like facial data and other stuff. But this is to show you like, this is like, this is what we currently exist in. Like we basically like have gotten to a place where like, we can make faces really, really well. Um, yeah, when they animate, it's super it's creepy. Like it is, yeah, it is like, or Animorphs, is that whatever that was? Yeah. <laughs> so like, but clearly an artist is looking at and like, cool, like we just made realism, right? So if, and if you're familiar with like the history of photography, um, or I guess the history of painting after photography, so up until the, the, the camera was invented, all painters wanted to, most painters wanted to get to realism, right? How do I make the most realistic painting possible? The second that the camera came out, people were like, well, we're never gonna touch a camera, so why don't we go do something else? And like, I feel like that's, that's kind of what we're starting to hit with machine learning, right? Like, 
we can now really make some really, really accurate looking faces. So like, what's the point? Like, let's just go into weirder places. Um, so this is Mike Tyka's work. Um, Mike is one of the people who invented Deep Dream. Uh, you haven't seen Deep Dream. I don't, we're not gonna do Deep Dream in this class, um, but like, it's cool, you can look it up. It's like all the puppy slug stuff and other weird trippy looking things. Um, this was like maybe a year before that other model I showed you came out. This was him trying to explore like, a similar idea with like how do we take really close faces where you could only I think you got like 256 or 512 by 512 and then scaling them up to try to create real human looking faces at high res and like it's pretty creepy right like anytime you try to touch faces you either end up with like something that's perfect looking or something that's really creepy and messed up it's that uncanny valley area um these are two really great people like so Adam Ferris we'll talk a little about like what he's doing here but basically he trained a model on flowers, and then he stopped in the middle and started training on faces, um, and then you end up with like a flower face. Super weird, but like kind of great at the same time. Like, I don't know. Um, and then uh, this is Janelle Shane. If you're not familiar with Janelle Shane's work, you have to look it up. She's amazing. Does a lot of stuff in text, uh, mostly, and a lot of like humor type of stuff. Um, but she went through a previously existing model of, I can't remember if this is Big Gan or another different model. Um, she went in and tried to find all the cats. Uh, these were what a machine described as cats. Um, and you can see like, yeah, that's kind of a cat. It's like the most fucked up looking cat on earth, but it's a cat, right? So like, artists were starting to explore like, again, what does a machine see as like an animal? Or what does a machine see as a face? And like, why are they getting it wrong? Or like, you know, what do we do about this? Like, that is definitely, that is like the strangest centipede looking cat I've ever seen, but it's kind of cool in its own way, right? Or like, it gives you as an artist new ways of thinking about how an animal could look. Or like, this is now the future, this is a cat in like 3,000 years. When the world is over and they have just taken over the earth, I guess. Yeah. Uh, this is some of my work. Um, so again, like, all my work explores florals. I'll explain why in a little bit. Uh, it's partly just because like it's what I have access to, um, but like so this is, again I took a um, I trained a model at very small sizes, um, and I scaled it up really big. So you'll see it like if you were to make this really small like a poster stamp and just like glance at it, you'd be like that's a flower. Um, but when you blow these things up, you start to get like these details that make it like feel really plasticky. You also get some details where um, you know. What's to, what should be a leaf has now turned into something else. What should be like one single flower bud has now like sort of turned into like a weird, I don't know, two. Um, so again, it's like playing with like how close to realism are we and like how far away are we from it. Um, this is Robbie Barat. I love Robbie's work. Um, I'll show a bunch more of his stuff. Um, this is him making a bunch of human figure models. So he makes each one of these individually, and then he like combines them all into like these like decadent sort of like, again, it's also playing with like art history, right? Like it's like taking like the art history of like, what was this, Victorian era? No, that's not Victorian. Whatever, I'm so bad at art history, this is why I deal with computers, but like taking like that sort of scene and like turning it into like this, these clay looking human pieces. Um, just really cool stuff. Um, so the other thing I think is really interesting about machine learning is that it's not as much about, well, it's not as much about creating as much as it is about curating, right? So like with a lot of these models, like it makes a bunch of stuff. Some of it is like very realistic, some of it is very not realistic, and it's up to the artist who is like sort of interpreting these to decide what direction they want to go in. It's also interesting because if you train, if two people train their models on the same data, you get the similar images. So this is my work on the left. Um, this is a company called FuseWorks on the right. We had access to the same image data. Um, and we get pretty similar looking pieces, right? So like, who's the artist here? I mean, technically we both are, but like we both trained it on the same data and like we did, got pretty similar results. So like, what differentiates our work? And here's Robbie Bratt. Um, so Robbie's work is on the left. Have you guys heard about this? Cool. Okay. So on the right is a company called Obvious. 
Robbie's work is all on GitHub. It's open source. He tells you how to do everything. This is going to be obvious. They're the exact same steps Robbie gave them. They sold this piece at Christie's for $400,000. Robbie said, hey, wait a second. Is any of that money mine? And the truth is, I don't know. These guys ran their own model. They probably tra they probably didn't even do their own training. It's not clear if they did their own training. It's been like kind of a legal battle about this whole thing. It's not clear if they just used Robbie's trained model and just like spit out an image from his model or if they trained it themselves. But like, who is the artist here? Is it obvious? Is it Robbie? Is it the artist? Is it the artworks that Robbie trained it on? Like, there's a whole question here about like who made what and who gets credit for what. Right? So Robbie downloaded off of like an open source art history library 50,000 portraits of white guys. This is what he got back. He made that model available. Obvious took it, produced their own images. It's not clear like who should take credit for this thing. And I don't and we don't have an answer for this. The thing that like is kind of bad about this is obvious emailed Robbie and asked for help. So like there's some like documentation here that like they clearly asked Robbie for help on how to make this stuff. They probably could have been a good person and like help like given him some credit. They didn't, whatever. But if this were if but if Obvious did this in their own world and just downloaded everything that was available on Robbie's GitHub and did this, it's a real question of like who owns this, who owns this thing? There's also a question of like, there are other people that are not me who will tell you that machines can't make art. So no matter what, this is not art, that this is like software, whatever. I, I don't get into those art theory discussions, but they're things to think about. Um, so I talked a little bit about like bad machine learning, which is like such a convoluted topic to discuss, but basically there are things that are bad in machine learning. Um, this is an example of my work. This is a thing called mode collapse. I'll talk a little bit about this maybe next week, maybe the week after. But basically this is what this is a bad thing. Like this shouldn't happen. Um, you'll see like these images, uh, so if you take the work that I did, or I guess what was, it was this, take this thing on the left, you should be seeing like different results, right? Like there's a bunch of different results here of images and whatnot. When I go here, I basically get all one image. And this is basically what the machine learns is like, it stops taking in other data and just says, all images look like this. So from a machine learning perspective, this is bad. Uh, from my Wallet, this was bad. I spent about three hundred dollars on this, and I got this. It sucked, but like these images are kind of cool. I, I can't really be that mad at them. Like I think this one's really trippy. Like I think these are interesting images, but it's just like it's not helpful to me. But some people see this and they're like, "This is really cool. Like, can I get a print of one of these?" Um, if someone wants to pay me three hundred dollars to recruit my fees, I will take that. Um, yeah, this is uh, another version of mode collapse. Um, and this is what it looks like in a video. So see, like, you're not really getting a whole lot of change, and you're making these, it's like, they quickly jump in between these things. Um, but again, it looks cool. So, again, it's like, if you're working on a project, and you think, I want it to look exactly like this, and you get like this out of it, and it's not what you wanted, is it bad, is it good? It's difficult to, to really discuss. Um, there's ways to fix this, or ways to like, you have to restart your model and like train from a new point, and you'll usually get a different thing. But uh, there's no, no one is saying like this is bad, bad art. It just it's like the process ended up not going the way I expected. Uh, and then this is the thing that just like most machine learning artists love to do is they love to take a tool that is meant for a certain purpose and do something else with it. Um, this is Jonathan Fly. I don't know if that's his real name. You should ask him. Um, but he has a lot of really great work in this area. So this is a thing called a super resolution model. Um, a super resolution model takes a low, uh, like let's say 24 pixels by 24 pixels. It scales it up uh, to a certain amount. So what he has done is he's taken really low res uh, images of things and like scaled them up. And he also does a thing where he, like, he scales it up a little bit, and he scales it back down, and he scales it up again, and he scales it back down. And you get like these really weird, like this, the crying emoji is now a dog, 
I don't like it, it's like and it, like but the thing is like now you can understand it right like if you look at those pixels that could be a dog snout why not like Santa is uh you know whatever um this is doom like so there's like a whole community of people that love to do this on vintage video games take the 8-bit graphics and convert them up um if you don't use his technique of like bouncing back and forth you'll generally get something a little bit cleaner and better um but like I, I mean, this is just like really fantastic. Like, some of these don't work at all. Like, this one is kind of eh, not really my thing. Um, this looks no better or no worse than the Sonic movie they're putting out. Um, it's kind of funny, right? Like, that dog one is amazing, but like the pig one, eh, it's like a blurry pig. Um, so, again, like, I think there's a lot of people who are just hacking on these things and just trying and playing with stuff and seeing what happens. Uh, this is another one of Jonathan's pieces. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, segmentation, but basically what this does is he is taking this video, he is running it through what's called segmentation, which basically like essentially posterizes this stuff. So it says this is an image, or like this is a shape, this is a shape, the sky is a shape, the background is a shape. Um, and then he puts it through um, a model that then retexturizes those images, or takes that segment and tries to apply something else to that color. I've got a better, I should have, when I, when I get back to the, there's an NVIDIA tool, when I get back to that one, this will make more sense. Um, I'm going to make that as a note for myself to flip those around. But basically you're seeing this car now being re-rendered in like a higher resolution. Pretty interesting. Uh, has, do anyone ever play with this? Edges of Cats. So Edges of Cats was, um, I think he took it down, but it was online for a, for a while. And basically what you do is you draw shapes of a cat, you hit process, and it turns into a cat. Uh, so what you train this on is you train it on real cats, you draw outlines of those cats, and then you've got training data. Probably like you need a thousand cats or something. Um, so people put this online, people had fun trying to draw cats that looked really like real cats. And then people had fun making really fucked up looking things. <laughs> If you put a tool online, expect someone to like destroy it, do something really disgusting with it. But it's pretty interesting, right? Like you train a model, do a specific thing, and when you break the boundaries of what it expects, you get something really interesting. I don't know. It's like this class is also like a horror class, I think. It's just like, how do I make really creepy looking things? Um, these models suck. So as I said, people make a lot of models um, and they have ideas about how these models should work, um, they don't often work the way you expect them to. Or they're like a cool concept, but they don't actually work. Uh, this is a model called Attention GAN. Um, I'll actually pull it up in Runway um, after we're done with this lecture. Um, but so Attention GAN, the way Attention GAN works is you feed an image and you feed it a sentence describing what the image is. So you do that for 50,000 images, whatever. So it's like, the bird is sitting on a, on a branch in winter, or um, I don't know, the goldfish is in the, is in the pool. Um, this is, so this is a thing we made in the class last week, or class last semester. This is a car parked on a beach. You can kind of see parts of the car, right? Like that, I mean, it's like mechanical. And they got the beach really well. They totally understood the beach. Um, but like, it's, if, you, if I were to tell you like, I'm gonna create a, an AI that is gonna be able to like interpret all your sentences and create pictures of that, and I showed you this as like the car is parked on the beach, you'd be like, get the fuck out. So again, when people tell me like AI is gonna take over the world in 10 years, I point to this and I'm like, sure. Like, you know, there are, again, there are places where like, Machine learning can be very great at one narrow thing. Certain things are not the right thing. So it's a cool model. It's fun to play with. I think Ralio made a poster using this. Um, like you just feed a sentence and you get like a really distorted image and he does his thing on it. Um, yeah, it's pretty interesting and pretty cool. All right. Uh, There's another one of Mario Klingemans. No sound for that one. Okay.
Um, here is my version of that same technique. No, this is not tension gain. So this is um, this is a pix to pix model, but the way it's set up is this is what's called next frame prediction. So what you do is you feed a video. The machine looks at every frame and the frame following, and it tries to learn how motion works or how a video frame is working. So in the case of uh, Mario's, he fed it on fireworks. So the machine is supposed to learn, like basically if this machine worked, the, or if this model worked the way that you would expect it to, it would spit out the exact same video you fed it. But it never works that way. And it always picks up weird tendencies of motion. So I think this one's great because you can see sort of exactly what it learned, right? Like little things explode like in the center, like they shoot out, they get bigger. But like it didn't learn like exploding from the center and only going out, right? It learned like go that direction, go that direction. And then like a bunch of other noise starts coming in. Like now they've just got sparkles coming out from like nowhere in the center. So again, this is not a good model, but it is really interesting art. Like no, like there's like this is really fascinating. Now it's got blue. I don't know where the blue came from. And like how long is the source video? Sure. So I don't know. Um, I can tell you the source video that I fed this was about. 30 seconds at 24 frames a second. Um, Mario's gotten this to work better and better um, by starting, instead of just looking at one frame ahead, he looks at like three or four frames ahead. Um, that requires some custom setup. Um, but like, I think this this is also really interesting because it's like, it's learning floating motion, right? It's got that, like this is not the same as that firework video. It learns sort of like things float, things like stop floating, maybe they move side to side a little bit, like. The video you give it is going to depend on what the motion it learns. Um, it's pretty interesting, but again, from like a model perspective of like, I can create a computer that will predict the next frame of an image or the next frame of a video. This doesn't work, but it's still really cool art. In this example, is it so? It seems kind of like it's like working pixel by pixel. Like there's no like object. Kind of detection happening um, in the model. Yeah, so that's like so. Yeah, so well, again, it's not learn. It's not object detection, but it is feature detection. Okay. It's still trying to learn features, okay. right? And you can kind of see it, like when it starts. Like, it kind of like it knows what a, what like the colors of a fish around it are, but yeah, it like doesn't remember the shape of it. Mm -hmm. um, you could. So the other thing about training stuff like this is like. Um, there's a number of iterations on how you train it. Uh, so the longer you bake it for, the more likely it is to get a better result. Um, but I'll tell you, like, I've never gotten it to be like actually good. Um, it's baking. <laughs> so I describe it as baking. It's actually just the time it takes for these things to train. So when you train a model, um, you could train a model for 30 seconds, and you'll get terrible results. You could train a model for 30 days, and the hope is you would get better and better results. Um, the truth is it's like baking it's like there's a happy medium where like if you overcook it it's gonna be burnt it's like not gonna be right if you undercook it it's definitely not gonna be good um so i just got it as baking because that's like the right metaphor for it this guy keeps going in and out um cool so it's the other thing about this the other thing that artists are most interested in is so when a company like google looks at like machine learning they try to figure out how do I get the most amount of data for this thing, right? So they're trying to train a cat versus a dog. They're going to try to find 50,000 photos of cats, 50,000 photos of dogs. They're going to stick some interns in there to like clean up the images, like prop them the right way. Um, artists are really interesting in like what's the opposite of that? How do I make the smallest amount of data, and how do I make cool images with that? Um, so this is Kishiyuma. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, you guys can crack all that stuff open. So, I think this piece is really interesting. So I'm pretty sure this is a style game model. Um, and what I think is really interesting is like, I think he fed it a video. So I think what he did is he gave it a video of someone just doing stuff with their hands, fed that in the model, and then 
did that sort of latent space animation through it. So this is like not how you're supposed to use StyleGAN. StyleGAN is supposed to have like thousands upon thousands of images of different things. And here he fed it a video, individual frames. Um, so this is essentially an idea of like how do I how do I find how do I do StyleGAN in like the smallest data pieces available. I want to. I'm gonna try some. Like, I'm actually gonna try some of this before we get into style again. Um, so I want to see how it works for us. Because I also think like what's interesting for this class is like you've got five weeks to build a data set, right? Like some data science groups will spend months just building a data set. Um, you clearly don't have that time, especially for this class. So like think about like what's the smallest amount of data I could use to make some of these things. Um, this is Helena Saren. She is super prolific. You go to her Twitter account, she posts a new thing every day. Um, really amazing work. I think she mostly uses Psychogam. Um, and most of her work is her own artwork. So she feeds her own photographs and her own sketches into her work. Um, so it's sort of like, as an artist, I'm only feeding the machine my own work, right? I'm not going to the internet and downloading images. I'm just going and like going out and photographing flowers. Um, maybe, maybe that's how this works. I've been trying to figure out how this works. Maybe this is like photographs of flowers and then like oil drips or something else where like these like, and she's converting between those two. Um, I know, I'll have to ask her. I, I also hate asking artists like how they did something, right? It's like, kind of like ruins the magic. Um, but I like to try to figure it out myself. Uh, this is also some of her work. So she also has told me like that she doesn't care about overfitting. And overfitting is sort of like that mode collapse where it starts to like learn just individual images and not like um, not like the generalization of it, of image sets. Um, but in her work, like it's also hard to tell what is like what is just photocopies that a machine will learn versus like new images. And maybe she doesn't care. So again, like do artists care if like it just photocopies your work but does it in a slightly different way? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Um, David Young is also really interested in this. Um, his work, these images are, I think they're single images trained on like a, like a style GAN type of thing. But they're trained for a very short period of time and they're only trained on one image. Um, so what is this thing really showing? It's a little hard to say. Um, if you go back to that network model of what an image, of what a machine learning model looks for, this might be like, the very most basic features of an image. So maybe it learns these shapes. It's trying to learn a little bit of color. Um, but these are pretty cool images. But again, it's like, this isn't what the model's meant for. Like he's just sort of playing with it a little bit and trying to explore what it could be. Um, Philip Schmidt um, worked for, Run or was a, was a visiting artist at, Run at Runway for a little bit. Um, What's cool about these images is he fed this he fed this these models blank images. So he fed uh, I forget this is a this is the super resolution model. So this is the one that like uh, scales up images. I don't remember exactly what this one was. But basically, he feeds them white images. And if you do it over and over and over and over again, you see the model has a bias built in. Uh, and this is really fascinating. Like we could do this like tomorrow, um, and play with it and see what happens with every model we have. Um, but I think it's just really interesting in that like this is a this is no data. This is like no data set. But after a while, either compression artifacts and they like convert to JPEGs or other things like start to like look like things to the machine. Like so, if you gave something like a really poorly compressed white image and it has like one speck of black. It says there's a thing there. I'm gonna like sick on it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna like make it bigger, right? So it's like these machines are trained to find things, and if you keep telling it there's nothing there, it's gonna find something eventually. All right, we are just about finished. Um, so the last category I want to talk about, which is like again maybe like a little bit more advanced, but like something that I think theoretically is where we want to head with machine learning, um, and that's like these are just tools. Like the point is that these are not like, for some artists, the machine learning model and what they make is the art. But like, I would like us to think about this as just the start of a new place. The start of, a, of like idea generation or moving to other things. 
Um, so this is some of my work. I just did this for Baffler magazine. Um, so what you'll see here is like inside of the TV screen is like that next frame prediction model. But like this is a bigger concept for an illustration for a magazine. Um, this is like the dumbest version of this that I can think of. Um, but again, like my point was not like I'm gonna do this in the in the video that comes out in the end of it. Um, this is the twelve I was talking about. This is Nvidia. Some cliff rock will be nice. Um, so what this, how this works, and how the other video works is like interesting all of these colors rock correspond to a shape away mountain. or correspond to a look. You can apply different styles to the image by regenerating the style code or by stealing styles from guide images. And then you're able to draw shapes directly. We continue drawing by adding a small beach. Trying different styles or trying different semantics. It's all up to you. Bob Ross. <laughs> <laughs> this time, yeah. let's draw some mountains and trees. I first draw a grass-covered hill in the foreground, and then mountain in the back. Um, so this is available in Runway. More cloud and uh, when I demoed this last semester, um, one of the students just like, while I was like talking hill. in every lecture, like you would just keep drawing stuff. Note just, that like, the same the label renders and, into uh, two visually lines. distinct objects, the trunk and the leaves of the tree. Now let's change the season. Even though we simply replaced grass with snow, our image generator did more than that. The tree leaves are gone, and there's now snow in the back mountain. If we go back to grass, the snow in the back mountain disappeared. Now I... Um, and then lastly, this is David Young. Or not lastly. Um, so on the left is an image he produced in a GAN. He hired a painter to paint that image. Um, this is what he gave the painter, and he said, paint me an image. Clearly, like, what I like is, like, the painter was kind of like, yeah, fuck you, buddy, I'm not going to copy this thing exactly. Like, I'm still going to do it my way, but, like, taking this as inspiration. Um, which I think is really interesting. I think mean, there's, like, a whole world to explore within this category. Um, again, this is one of my favorite projects. Uh, Robbie does, like, such amazing work in, the, in these areas. So Robbie uh, and this other guy, Mushbu, um, trained again on um, fashion photos, so runway photos. Um, they then took whatever the GAN produced out of that runway photo, and they made the clothing. So this is one of the GAN images. They said, wow, this is a really cool, weird-looking bag on these legs. What if we hired a, hired a fashion creator to make that? Uh, so what they learned about this model is that actually, like, what this is is this was a purse. So if you imagine, like, a bunch of people holding a bag, it's always really, like, when they hold it and they walk in a certain way, it's always right against your leg. So the machine, like, sort of learned, like, hey, there's a bag here that's off in there. But also, some of there are in a handle. So, like, let's just re let's combine those, right? So this is just, like, really interesting, like, ways to, like, take creative ideas and then, like, actually produce them. Um, I saw just this week, they're doing it. They're doing a show in Vienna, somewhere, maybe, oh, Belgium. Um, so they produced a bunch of clothing based on those photos. Um, and what I like about it is, like, really like that weird abstract sort of GAN texture. They're, like, finding a way to, like, make that into, like, ragged cut up clothes. Um, like, I can't see, there's not enough detail here in this one. Oh, I guess it's this one. But like there's like straps sometimes and straps not sometimes. Um, but it's really fascinating. And this is a part of a show um, with like Victorian fashion. This is like the future of fashion or something like that. Um, so really, really interesting stuff. 